Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'm here in our annex space. Um, tried to pretty it up with some skulls in the background to get the mood. Um, but uh, we're delighted to be talking with Karen Olson today. She's going to be talking about her brand new book, An Inconvenient Wife. And uh, Karen signed a batch of books for us, which we've just received. And uh, I'll go ahead and put a, as usual, I'll put a, a link in the comments field um, should you wish to purchase one of our remaining signed copies. And also, if you have questions that occur to you throughout the hour, just go ahead and type them in uh, on Facebook or YouTube, and uh, Barbara will bring me on screen, and I'll be happy to ask any of your questions. So, Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. So, Karen, I'm surprised we haven't met before. Probably my error. And I see that your first Annie Seymour book, Sacred Cows, won the Sarah Ann Friedman Award. And Sarah Ann was one of my dearest friends. I miss her to this very day. You know, she died unexpectedly, and it's been hard to, to make up for it. Did you ever have a chance to meet her? I actually never did meet her, although I'm going to be perpetually connected to her because I won this award and you know I was I was really really grateful because my editor at the time was Kristen Weber who worked very closely with her and took right. over when after she passed away and I just you know like I said I've, I've only heard wonderful things about her and I wish I had met her well, I wish so. I had too. she was a very very special person very very much a New Yorker but really loved books she had this astonishing private library and I know that her husband, Ira, was totally daunted by inheriting this library all of a sudden because the way she died, there was no chance, you know, to make any disposition of anything. And I've often wondered what happened to this. But she was so kind hearted. You know, people um, down in the lowest rungs in publishing often at that time didn't make very much money. And Sarah Ann used to have regular parties at her home, author events and, you know, other things. And she would have them all catered and bring in all this food so she could divide it up and send it all home with the executive wow. and curatorial and other assistants because she worried, you know, that they weren't getting enough to eat. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was great. Anyway, you have written, um, you've also been a Seamus Award nominalist, finalist, sorry, and you have some interesting titles, Annie Seymour Mysteries, Tattoo Shop Mysteries, and Black Hat Thrillers. So all of a sudden, here you come with um, this really very interesting book. I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can do a follow up to it because it's so brilliant. But um... well, they want the, my agent is pushing me to do a follow up. Although I did sort of veer far away from the history, so I I've been trying to figure out how I could come back to it. Um, because I started out really much more based in the history than I ended up. Um, it's, you know, I've had this lifelong obsession with Henry VIII and his wives. Um, I, I read a book when I was 14 called A Crown for Elizabeth, um, which as someone pointed out, that was like my gateway drug to the, the Tudors when I was 14 and I had to write a book report and that was what I wrote the book report on. And ever since then, I've read everything that I can. I, I really don't read a lot of fiction about the period because the facts are so much more interesting to me. <laughs> well, you know, it's the whole industry. I mean, there's no question that um, Henry VIII and his six wives and all the rest of it is an entire industry that really starts earlier uh, with Edward the Fourth and the princes in the tower, and then Henry the Seventh marrying uh, um, Edward's daughter and consolidating the roar, the roar, the roses, you know, the red and the white, um, and then Henry's brother Arthur dying in Ludlow Castle. I actually made a pilgrimage to Ludlow Castle and watched really? a fascinating play, a version of I'm trying to remember what it was. Shakespeare played out on the castle walls because it's a rune. And, you know, so Henry came to the throne by accident. I mean, he was not the elder son. And um, oh, so yeah, his no. brother, Arthur, who was married to Catherine of Aragon, uh, but they were married so young in those days that the the purported deal was that the marriage was never consummated because the both Arthur and Catherine were too young. So when Henry suddenly became um, heir to the throne, 
he inherited his brother's fiance as well. Um, and, you know, that kind of kicks the whole thing off. But, you know, think about the other Boleyn girl. Think about, um, you know, oh, yeah. all of the books that have centered around this amazing dynasty that took more than a century, maybe two, I'm trying to remember, to get to the throne. And then... It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that long because then it was no, over. It wasn't. It was first. 1399, I think, when Henry the the Fourth was able to take over. If you go back and read um, Catherine by Anya Seton, it's probably the very best okay. preparation there is for what understanding the dynamic of what happened um, that divided up the family and and led it in that direction. I I'm that was my gateway drug, Anya. Uh, Seton's <laughs> book really, I think, still is like the definitive book about how the whole um, split between the Lancastrians and the Yorks came yeah. about and how it eventually. I, I read that one in high school as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think I read all of Seton's books in high school. <laughs> sure. But I mean, you know, one of the supreme ironies about Henry, who tried so desperately to have an heir is that his only legitimate son died was not healthy and died young and his illegitimate son with Mary Boleyn was incredibly healthy and you know lived to be old and fathered all these children and so basically Henry got mixed up with the wrong Boleyn girl I mean you yes. know first <laughs> Anne but he married the wrong Boleyn girl he should have married Anne and legitimized um Henry Hunston the son from that and then the whole thing wouldn't have happened yeah <laughs> Well, a lot of people think he should have just stayed married to Catherine, but you know, that's then really nothing would have happened. But huh? you know, he, he was so obsessed with having a son, you know. That was one of the things with my book is it's like, okay, so how do, how do I modernize this? Right. You know, in today's day and age, that wouldn't be an issue. And so I, you know, that's not even something that's in my book, although that was that was the whole catalyst for everything. So it, it just, you know, trying to, to modernize it. Also, you know, one of the things that I, you know, was trying to work out is, okay, why on earth would, you know, Kate Parker, the sixth wife, marry him, you know, after he's had all these wives? I mean, Catherine Parr had no choice you know if the king set his eyes on you and said okay you're going to be my wife that was pretty much it but in today's time that doesn't happen so that was one of the things i had to kind of work out is why on earth would she marry this guy <laughs> after you know after five wives and you know yes, i think so and, and you have to deal with you know the the anne of cleves the wife the fourth wife that he divorced did not die um, and so, you you know, if you're trying to be faithful to what was going on, you had to figure out how to include her. I love the way, I love the names. I think you were so clever with the names. Hank Tudor. Hank Tudor is the um, the guy here, the billionaire businessman that is the center of the drama. And each wife you have brought up to, I think, a wonderful name, Caitlin Howard, you know, the, the fifth wife, the beheaded wife. And as you say, Kate Parker was really Catherine Parr, the one wife that became the widow and survived him. Um, but all of them. So you must have had a great time trying to work out how to name all these characters. It was, that was the easy part. Because <laughs> <Really? laughs> you know, the book actually started as a police procedural years ago with the state trooper who's in the book as like the main character who's going to solve the crime. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized, no, that's not the way this should go. <laughs> so I pivoted and went back to the wives because I said that, you know, that's what people are interested in. You know, the people are interested in the wives. And I think that that's kind of what kept, has kept this story going for 500 years. You know, the, the wives are at the center, you know, because I think without the wives, yeah, you know, Henry might have sort of just been another blip in history. Um, but because he had this whole, you know, everything with the wives and the wives were the catalyst for the religion and changing religious history in England, it just, 
but it all starts with the wives. So that's where I said, okay, this is, I have to change how I'm looking at this story. And that's how I decided to concentrate mostly on the wives. Well, you know, it was, it was the wives. I totally agree with you, but also, you know, England was a Catholic country and therefore the Pope had a tremendous influence in Henry. You know, a lot of what powers these changes is economics. And, you know, Henry looked around and saw how much money the Catholic Church had tied up and was taking in. Um, you know, they had a ton of property. They had, you know, people, um, you know, either tithing or, or you know, making donations. Um, I think that part of it was that Henry was a modernizer in his own way. And he really wanted to, and did, take control of the, you know, the church properties and the church incomes. In fact, he gave out. That's why so many of the English country houses are called abbeys, you know, because they were. Um, and he handed them over to to people. So I think I think it was both, you know, the fact that Pope wouldn't let him divorce Catherine to marry Anne Boleyn was definitely a major thing. But I think then he saw that he had an opportunity here to, you know, become much more powerful, gain control of the religion, make himself head of the Church of England, acquire all this property, and have the money flowing into him, not to Rome. Well, I think some of that idea came from Tom Cromwell, too, mm -hmm. who was very ambitious. And he, he, you know, he was advocating for the dissolution of the monasteries and taking all of the money. Um, you know, I mean, I look at the wives, too. I mean, they were, you know, I mean, Anne Boleyn, you know, it. she was a Protestant. I mean, as, as close to a Protestant as you could be in that time. And by the time we got to Catherine Parr, you know, she was really part of the Reformation and really part of Protestantism. And, you know, her, I mean, she was friends with, you know, the so-called heretics, you know, Anne Askew, uh, who was, you know, she was burned because she was a heretic, but she was really just someone who spoke out, you know, for the new religion. And, you know, Catherine Parr was actually pretty lucky that she didn't, you know, end up the same way Catherine yeah. Howard did or Anne Boleyn did. So there were there were a couple of moments where it looked like that was going to happen. Well, <laughs> so, yeah, she was, she was pretty smart. <laughs> she was lucky to have outlived him. But then, unfortunately, you know, she fell into the into a relationship with Thomas Seymour, which ended up killing her. So, you know, she wasn't lucky in, in that respect. I don't know. She might have might have done better if Henry had lived longer. But anyway, I brought up the, the economic part because in order to make Hank Tudor the central character to your book, um, sort of a Henry VIII figure, he had to be extremely rich, right? He had to be a billionaire with all the sort of power and whatever that goes with that. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's funny, because um, when I first was thinking about him, and what was I going to do with him? I was thinking, you know, Rupert Murdoch, you know, sort of a Rupert Murdoch character, you know, with all, you know, with this multimedia, you know, international corporation, and, you know, and he did have to be rich. And there, you know, you know, I couldn't put the, I didn't, you know, you can't, you, I couldn't really put religion into it, because that, yeah would get sort of muddled, but, you know, with business and shareholders and, you know, corporate, you know, decisions, it's that plays into all of that as well. So, and then that's where Catherine comes in too, in, in my book is she, you know, she's kind of, she's a player and she was a player back then too. I mean, she, she was, I think she was actually smarter than he was. And, you know, she, she was a, she was a real contender for him. I mean, it was, she was just so tenacious and, you know, wouldn't let him go. And I really wanted to keep all of that because that, you know, really, she was, she was a tough woman. And, you know, I, I really, really wanted to bring that across in the book. 
I think I, think I did. You did. <laughs> Definitely so. And you know, really modern these modern mega corporations are really basically kingdoms. You're calling it Tudor Enterprises. But um, you know, for all I know, the gross national product of Tudor Enterprises could have been as big as the, you know, Tudor England, um, because that was really before England um began its march towards world power and colonialism and all. I mean, it was a it was a real transition from a medieval state towards a more modern state, and Henry played a big part of it. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of luck involved. I mean, the Spanish Armada could have taken them out, you know, but thanks to the storm and other things, um, they managed to survive it. So there was no, you know, completely clear path to England becoming the power that it did. It took It took a lot of different things to make it work. Uh, but that's true of modern corporations as well. And so I thought you did brilliantly calling it Tudor Enterprises. And um, and I I love what you have the wives to Anna Klein, who basically is Anna Cleves, running a bed and breakfast, which I thought was hilarious, <laughs> keeping an eye on things because, you know, she she was the luckiest of all the wives, right? Because, you know, she uh, she was amicably divorced and didn't have to put up with Henry. Well, she was really the true survivor of all of them. I mean, yeah. she never married again. And she had this status as the king's sister. And they kept gifting her all of these wonderful properties. And yeah. she she had a pretty good life, you know, she after did. you know, after being married to Henry. And she wasn't only she was only married to him for about six months. Oh, I know. So that's all. Holbein portrait that, you know, that's a, a famous thing. Henry had a court painter whose work I am a huge admirer of Hans Holbein, the younger, I think he is, maybe not, but anyway, I think he is. And he painted a very, very flattering portrait of Anne of Cleves, which is kind of like how people before Tinder and other things got to know each other as, you know, they would exchange portraits. And um, when Henry actually met her, she didn't live up to the portrait and he was he was not happy. Um, so they divorced. But, you know, by doing that, she avoided all the, you know, not just the danger of being married to Henry, but also the dangers of childbirth. You know, I mean, people, I mean, which is what killed Catherine Parr in the end, you know. Um, I've often, I've had a lot of debates with people about Elizabeth, why it is she chose never to marry and never to have children after her whole dynasty was all about having an heir to the throne. And I I think there are various lines one could follow to that, but I've often thought that one of them was that she was terrified of childbirth. Yeah, I I agree. I I think she she didn't want to risk her life, and you know she saw people die in childbirth. I mean, she saw she was close to Catherine Parr, and she saw right. her die. You know, and you know, well, Jane Seymour died in childbirth as well. That's right. So, you know, there's always been speculation, you know, would Henry have stayed married to her if she'd lived because she did give him the son that she wanted and it's it's possible. Um, but I don't know, he was a little bit of a wanderer. So it's possible that he would have tired of her too, regardless. Well, so. or he could have been like Charles II and just, you know, kept her while he had mistress after yeah. mistress, you know, so... I mean, you know, the lives of English monarchy, I mean, we're seeing it today, you know, that the, the English monarchy has always been sort of scandal driven, you know, um, they have somewhat it's... messy personal lives. There was an essay today in the Washington Post about the brother of the new king of Denmark and how he's figured out his role and what his family is like and the whole bit and contrasting it. And they don't go for um, the kind of messy you know, personal lives mm -hmm. that British seem to constantly indulge in. So who knows? Anyway, um, I think your book is really brilliant. I think it means more. I mean, you can read it without knowing anything about the Tudors, okay? It's, it's, it's a standalone book and it's wonderful. But if you happen to be a history buff or at least know anything about, about the Tudor dynasty and Henry and his wives, then it's really fun. To, to work that out. Tell me how it is you think you can write a sequel. Well, that's the hard, that's the hard, that's the hard question right now is trying to sort of, you know, because I did leave some open ends 
um, at the end of this book, but they were mostly on purpose. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I did, it's funny because when I first really delved into this, I was trying to stay very, very close to history and it was really frustrating me. And when I gave myself permission to not stick as close to the history as I thought maybe I should, it was very liberating because then I said, okay, now I can be, I can be a mystery writer. You know, I can start throwing in the twists and the turns and the surprises that people expect from a mystery novel. And that, you know, but then I, you know, it did, I did veer a bit away from history from that. So kind of pulling it back in for another book is, is a challenge. I'm, I'm working on that now and trying to work it out. So yeah, I'm hoping daughter, I, sorry, pardon? I was going to say there are two children that we haven't even mentioned called Lizzie and Teddy, um, which, you know, are another riffs on names, but Lizzie of course survives all this. You know, so does her older sister Mary. So um you do have you do have the next generation to work with. I have and there's there's a lot of murder and mayhem that happens um going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, and then of course, you know, if you think about, you know, just Tudor history, there's Mary Queen of Scots and there's Lady Jane Grey, and you know, so there's there's a lot of directions this could go in. So mm -hmm. it's you know, it's just trying to sort of rein it all in and seeing, okay, do I do one more book? Do I do more than one more book? And, you know, just try to figure out what to well, do you, with you that. You reasonably do a trilogy, I think. I don't know whether you want to, you know, take it all the way down to the Stuarts, but um, you certainly right. you certainly could do three books with it. It's the history that, that brings in the irony. I mean, you know, you're right that it does, It you know, have the... the um, various impulses of the mystery. And I did think one, one person who quoted it or who blurbed it for you said that Olson brilliantly captures the psychological terror of the Tudor period, translating it into a vivid 21st century world. I'm not sure that people around Elon Musk don't suffer from the same kind of psychological terror that people around Henry VIII did, but I do think that it was a time um, where, where terror was a very familiar emotion because it really was at the whim of people, whether Henry or maybe his agent, Thomas Cromwell or whatever, really had the power of life and death over you. Well, there were, there were a lot of people executed <laughs> during oh, those really? years. And, you know, sometimes no rhyme or reason for it. I mean, if it, all you have to do is look at Anne Boleyn though because it was a matter of weeks before she was arrested and executed, mm -hmm. just a matter of weeks. And, you know, I mean, she had just had a miscarriage in January and Catherine of Aragon had just died. Um, so she actually had a couple of months where, okay, only one wife of Henry VIII was alive at, at the same time. And, you know, but, they decided, you know, it, it was mostly Cromwell decided she had to go and they built this case against her. And it was literally weeks. It was, I don't know, two or three weeks. So that was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm clicking. Um, it's, it was really, you know, it's just kind of shocking how quickly that I happened. think it was too. You know, and, you, know you mentioned um, children. I mean, if Anne Boleyn hadn't miscarried, it was a boy. If she had not yeah. miscarried, um, that probably would have brought it all to a halt too. Um, because right. that's what Henry ostensibly wanted was a son. And that's not to say that he would have been a faithful husband or he might not have eventually decided to put her away, but um, it would have been it it would be better for the for the child if the mother, you know, was still around. So that was really bad luck for for Anne Boleyn. I think the fact that she had a miscarriage. But you know, one of the things about um, the Tudors, at least that you know, they were not good at reproducing. You know, which is sort of a primary job of a you know of a 
of a monarch in those days, but um, there there seems to have been some, you know, some difficulty, whether it was um, blood incompatible. I mean, Catherine or Mary, they must have had an RH factor or something going on there that she constantly got pregnant, but she could not keep the baby. And that, that happened years later to um, Queen Anne. You know, she had, mm -hmm. Queen Anne had 18 children. And all yeah. of them died except one who had encephalitis and eventually he died. And that's what brought the Stuart dynasty to an end. So there was some genetic component um, yeah. that made- Well, there know, was a lot of, there was a lot of inbreeding too yeah. going on. Cousin, first cousins marrying first right. cousins. And it, it was, you know, that's kind of what happened back then. And yeah, there were, there were a lot of issues you know, with, with fertility and, you know, I mean, and it wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, I mean, Catherine had several miscarriages, Anne Boleyn did, um, you know, I think he was lucky that he had the three children that he did. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and Elizabeth, but he never really have, was, sorry? Well, he did have, you know, he did have a son with Bessie Blount, you know, Henry Fitzroy, who, right. you know, he was actually rising through the ranks, but then I don't know if he caught the sleeping, the, the sweating sickness. I don't know. He died. It might've been the sweating sickness. Um, and then, you know, there's been speculation about Mary Boleyn's children. Were they Henry's children? Were they not? You know, nobody knows for sure. It's, you know, that's that's always been questioned. Now it's a complicated so, time, and now people are trying to figure out what did happen to the princes in the tower. Which, you know, um, the answer to that question has a lot to do with how legitimate the um, the Tudors were. Um, if the boys survived, you know, or what happened to them, who killed them, we can go to Josephine Tay, or we can go to you know various um, literary as well as scientific you know discussions about what happened to the to the boys. And their sister, Elizabeth, was married to Henry Tudor, which must have been ghastly for her in lots of ways, but she didn't have much choice. But what did what did happen to the boys? That's a really good question. Well, I think Richard the Third killed them, but that's, you know, my own personal opinion. Um and actually, I mean, Henry the Seventh, you know, defeated Richard the Third at, you know, Bosworth and became king, but he spent his entire reign like trying to get rid of people who were going to challenge him. Yeah. Because he had a very tenuous hold on, you know, whether he should be king. Very tenuous. And very tenuous. And that sort of bled into Henry VIII's reign too, because then he had to kind of deal with all of that. Yep. So it's, you know, <laughs> It was it's an interesting time. It was well. It's a giant soap opera, no question about it. You know, um, I think we all exactly. have exactly. Yeah, we all have to recognize that. I think it was an inspired idea to write um, an inconvenient wife. Um, and as I said, you can read it and enjoy it if you don't know anything about the Tudors or Henry the Eighth. But it's a lot more fun if you. It's extra fun, not a lot more fun. Extra fun if you can appreciate the irony in it and the you know, the features like coming up with the names and, and setting it all up that way. So tell us a little bit about your earlier books. Are they still in print? Um, I'm not familiar with them. Um, my Annie Seymour series, I wrote four. Um, they're not in print anymore, but you can get them as eBooks, right. I guess, thing, still, I think, um, online. And that was a series with... Um, Annie Seymour, who is a police reporter in New Haven. And I was a journalist for years. I worked for newspapers all over Connecticut and I, you know, grew up in New Haven in the area. And I worked for the New Haven Register for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they said, write what you know. So I wrote what I knew and I had a lot of fun with it because each of the four books is set in a different neighborhood in New Haven because each of New Haven's neighborhoods has sort of its own personality. Yeah. So that's 
that was a lot of fun was to write about my hometown. But then my mysterious press had folded and my editor went to Penguin and my second two Annie Seymour books were with Penguin. But then my editor said, oh, we're looking for a tattoo shop mystery. And this was back in the rage, like Kat Von D was on TV and everybody was getting tattoos. So my editor said, would you be interested in writing a tattoo shop mystery? And I said, well, I don't have any tattoos, but sure, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and I decided to set it in Las Vegas because the whole idea was just crazy. And so I have a tattoo artist who solves crimes in Las Vegas. And I had great fun writing those books. I haven't been in Las Vegas that much, but you really don't have to be <laughs> right. to write about it. Um, I think that's so funny. So those, okay. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think and that's such an interesting thing to think. And it's true, especially um, back when mass market paperbacks and all just kind of ruled that um, you could look for like a niche, you know, I mean, yeah. we need a tattoo shop mystery, or we need a candle making shop mystery, or we need a chocolate shop mystery, or, you know, it was, um, I thought fast, you know, at one point, Berkeley, which is, you know, part of Penguin there, had something like 900 different, um, you know, concepts, paper banks, um, and even on the author's names, in many cases, you know, they would have people writing, you could write two or three different um, series like that and just take up a different name, which the publisher owned. And therefore, if you stopped writing it, you know, you didn't take the name with you because it wasn't your name in the first place. Uh, we're not seeing as much of that now. The categories are broader, but they were really fun for people, I think, who just wanted to escape reading and you know, could learn a little bit about tattoos or chocolate making or whatever. I still get emails from people asking me if they're going to be any more tattoo shop mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, well, they, haven't gone, away. they haven't gone away. People are still uh, very heavily tattooed. So I'm not at all surprised. Uh, did you have Although to get... It's I'm sorry. It's actually interesting, though, because down not far from my house, there's a, a tattoo removal place. <laughs> And I've seen a few of those. So I'm wondering if the tattoo, there's some tattoo regret going on. Well, <laughs> I think there always has been, you know, people give way to impulse and relationships break up or, um, you know, people get older. Tattoos don't look that great on old skin that's all wrinkly, you know, it, it's more of a younger, younger person's game, I think. Um, so, yeah, I can... Well, well, one of the, I actually found a book before I started writing the series, because like I said, I have no tattoos. Um, I found a book called Bodies of Subversion. And I can't remember the name of the author, but it's all about women and tattoo and the history of women and tattoo. And it was fascinating. And it's one of the reasons why I decided to, to do the series because it was very interesting. And there was a, there were, there's photographs in this book of this woman like in her 90s who's just completely covered in tattoos and just is absolutely thrilled with this and it was it was really interesting to read about you know why women get tattooed it's very different for women than for men and it it was it it definitely convinced me to write the book because i said i think i can definitely work with this Sure. So, so I, I called that series my cozies with an edge. <laughs> Love it, cozies with a needle. Right. Well, I mean, you know, it it can in some cases it's a it's a cultural identity. I mean, the Maori in New Zealand, you know, the the tattooing, the right. tattooing, and all is part of who they are. Um, yeah. You know, it's a lot different than like a sailor tattoo or you know a relationship tattoo or all the various kinds that. Um, that come along. So um, no, I, th I mean, I think it's fascinating. When I was young, tattooing was not, was not popular. And then all of a sudden it sort of took off again, you know, so who knows? I love it. I don't have any tattoos either, but I probably would have if I, you know, had, had been young decades later. 
who can tell? All right. And then what else have you written? You wrote, you wrote the Annie Seymour and you wrote the tattoo. What are the black hat thrillers? The black hat thrillers are, it's another, I seem to write books in sets of four. <laughs> so I have four books in this series and it's basically a sort of a middle-aged woman who was a tattoo, uh, not a I'm, I'm still on the tattoos, who was a computer hacker when she was young and committed a crime mm. using her computer. And so she escapes to this little island called Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island mm. and lives off and lives off the grid. Um, no computer, no bank account, nobody knows where she is. And one day someone from her past shows up and finds her. Um, so it's, it's four books where she's on the run from both the people that she stole from and from the FBI. And I had a great time writing them because they're not really mysteries. Yeah. And it's just, you know, I think a re one reviewer said, oh, it's kind of like watching like a Hitchcock film or <laughs> just people just, you know, she just she was just constantly on the run and each book is set in kind of a cool place the first one's on black island the second one is in up in quebec in canada because i had left her there after the end of the first book and then my publisher wanted a series and i said oh but she's safe now <laughs> now i have to have a reason for her to leave um and then then she ends up in uh Paris and she's in South Carolina for a while. She's in Miami. So it's sort of a travelogue. So I was a I was a travel editor at the New Haven Register. So okay. I like writing about different places. <laughs> so that's what I did with that series. It was fun. I know nothing about computers. I, I know as much about computers as I do about tattoos. Um, but I spent a lot of time online and trying to figure out what the heck Bitcoin is, which I still don't completely understand it. Um, I had to learn a little bit about coding. Which, and I think if somebody who actually knows about these things reads my books, they'd be like, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But I think I, I you know, I think for people who don't really know that much, I think it's, it's okay. <laughs> so. But you weren't, you weren't writing for an audience of people sophisticated in, in Bitcoin and so forth. And, you know, I think, I mean, one of the things I've always loved about crime fiction is the chance to learn things that you uh, might not otherwise come across. You know, there's a lot of just sort of random and interesting knowledge that you can acquire if you're, if you're a mystery reader. And I don't know, you know, if you really want to get deeply into it, you can veer off the fiction and dive into nonfiction and, you know, try to learn something. But um, I think, I think, you know, for sort of a broad view of many things, it's very hard to be crime fiction. Yeah. Well, the one thing that I did learn from doing that series is how scary the internet is. And I actually, because I learned about skimmers on the, when you go to the gas station, if you put your credit card in at the, the, the actual pump, they've got these little things called skimmers that can read your card. Right. I don't pay inside now because I don't tr <laughs> I don't trust the gas pumps. And that was one of the things that I learned while I was writing these books is, you know, little yeah. things like that and how how much our information can be stolen from us and how much it can be sold for, yeah. you know, because I, you know, I discovered on the dark web somebody will pay $50 for like 500, you know, people's informations about, you know, just all of their information. It's like for 50 bucks, you can get it. It's, it's a little scary. <laughs> well, it's so. very scary, but you know, it indeed, um, there's a constant, you know, not reinvention, but a constant stream of new crimes that um, are actually old crimes, but, you know, have a, more modern. I mean, it's like an ATM, you know, I mean, until people got more careful, um, you're, and you could still, you could still be stuck up, you know, and forced to take money out of your ATM account and so forth. But 
um, yeah, I think technology has enabled criminals in all kinds of ways. And it, it not just criminals, but it it has allowed people in in communities that you wish weren't weren't communities to get together. I've read that it has enabled anorexia. It certainly has enabled child pornography. You know, I mean, for all the good it does, there's a really dark side to it. And as a crime yeah. writer, you have to you have to think about that, you know. But I like to move through the world thinking most of it is well intentioned and, you know, hope for the best. <laughs> um it a lot of it depends on where you live. A lot of it depends on, you know, your age, I think. And um Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's it's funny because who was it? We were watching 60 minutes. I don't know if it was this past week or the week before, and they were talking about, you know, like, you know, how, you know, there's all this ransomware and, you know, companies are finding, you know, that somebody's hacking into their system and taking over and then demanding millions of dollars. You know, that's actually part of the second of my, of my books in the series, you know, but, you know, I, I just, I looked at my husband, I said, there's going to be some guy somewhere in a basement who's just going to shut us all down yeah well <laughs> and, we can, and there's that. nothing we can do about it because everything is on the internet now yeah everything well you can't really and, through the world without a cell phone i mean i do a lot of traveling i'm just back from left coast crime and did a cruise before then you can't travel without a cell phone and the minute you have a cell phone there you are you can be hacked you can't you know, you can't shop on Instagram, you can't shop at the grocery store, you know, everything you do. And as, as more and more is done on your phone, you know, Google Pay or whatever it all is, then the opportunities for hacking seem to constantly increase. So I don't want, for example, I don't want to have a smart doorbell because it's just one, I don't oh, want yeah, to no. hack their way into my house. I mean, you know, I want them to have to have an actual key or break a window, but, you know, I don't want them to, you know, figure out how to hack hack the house. And the same is true. There have been several very interesting um, thrillers where people are driving and somebody hacks their car. Have, and Kathy yeah. writes in this book that, you know, that happens. That, um, and yes. you have to think about that. You know, do you, a car is a big computer now, you know, and oh, how yeah. vulnerable are you if you're inside the car where they can lock you in and take over the steering and, you know, the next thing you know. So... Um, I don't know whether yeah. you know, one of the questions is, are, can you, for those kinds of things to happen to you, can you be completely innocent um, or can you be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or in fact, can you be in a profession or up to something that brings you in contact with people who actually know how to hack your car? Because, you know, I don't think my neighbors here are actually up to speed on how to, how to hack my Mercedes, <laughs> you know, but um, so I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know how, how easily anyone can protect themselves anymore. So maybe, maybe a lot of know. luck, you know, wandering through life, hoping nobody will spot you. Well, this is why we still drive a 2007 Subaru Forester. There's no computers <laughs> in this, in the car. Good and work. it's, you know, my husband is a real Luddite. I, I mean, I think he keeps saying that he doesn't want his cell phone, but I, I keep telling him you can't live without it. No. And no. he doesn't quite understand this. We we renovated our kitchen a few years back. And, you know, the guy at the appliance store was trying to sell us a smart refrigerator. And I said, my refrigerator does not need to be on the internet. <laughs> no. Nobody right. needs to I don't need to have a refrigerator that's, you know, connected to my well, Wi-Fi. <laughs> I think it's all kind of enabling us to accept AI, you know, because, I mean, if you reach the point where your refrigerator is going to tell you what you're out of and what you need to go grocery <laughs> for, then, you know, it just sets you up one step down the road towards that. Well, we've digressed. Um, Patrick, come and, come and talk to us. But I, I would like to say that I truly enjoyed this book. It's just so much fun. And you can read it as an historian and love it that way. And you can read it just as a really interesting thriller. Well, you guys got seriously far afield. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we really did. I know. But it was fun. It is interesting, too. I mean, how much of how much of our information we give away. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And once the genie's out of the bottle, it's very hard to 
You can't really put it back. I know we're all moving in that direction, whether we want to or not. You know, think about Space Odyssey 2001. You know, I mean, Hal is with us today for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of people tuning in. Um, let me see if there's any anything in the way of actual questions. Um, <laughs> there's some people with tattoo tattoo experience here. Uh, yeah, Robin says, no <laughs> tattoos, but almost got two cat paw prints on the top of my foot for my 50th birthday. Yay. And the tattoo artist was too hungover at my appointment, so we left. So she dodged, <laughs> well, that's dodged true. You that wouldn't want a drunk tattoo artist to be working on you. You no. take the lines and whatever. Whoa. Exactly. <laughs> um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see here. Not a lot of actual questions just well, how could they when we roamed around in the fashion well that people we that are you know just saying this book sounds fascinating i'd love to read it um you know some obvious fans of of your earlier work uh right well okay. I, I, I should Let me jump should over to youtube no nothing there no just a little yeah. brief description of the plot which we kind of ignored um honeymoon plans for businessman hank tudor and his sixth wife um, go awry when a headless body is discovered near Hank's summer home, forcing Kate Parker, the sixth wife, to contend with two more of his exes, Catherine Alvarez, the first, who lives as a shut-in with her computers, carefully following Tudor Enterprises, and Anna Klein, the fourth, who runs a bed and breakfast, where she and her wife keep a steady eye on things, particularly Hank's children, Lizzie and Teddy. So... We have Tudor era betrayals. We have numerous wives. We have an actual murder. We have a lot of things going on. That's why I said you can read it as a standalone without knowing anything about Henry VIII and his wives and the Tudors, or, or you can really have fun reading it as a, you know, an, a reimagining, right, of what it would, or an up to date. Maybe it's just bringing you up to date. But anyway, I loved it. I thought it was just so much fun. Here's a question. Um... Let's see, Renee would like to know, what time frame does the book series take place for the woman on the run? For the what? I'm sorry. For the, the woman, woman on, on the run? Oh, that's contemporary. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely contemporary, yeah. But it's, it's interesting to think about this drama of the 16th century is contemporary. I mean, it it didn't take any any genius to. I mean, well, it did. You know what I mean. But but the fact that a situation that took place that many years ago, centuries ago, could actually be taking place right now. It actually really could. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's that's that's what's really interesting about this. And you know, like like I said, the thing is with the wives is they. I tried to keep their personalities intact as mm -hmm. to the actual personalities of the actual historical figures. And they were all very progressive, intelligent women who, you know, were just living in a time when, you know, their sex was, you know, considered inferior. And, you know, so bringing them into present day was really fun because like, okay, now we can really look at these women for who they were and appreciate them and, you know, see that I actually think they were all even smarter than Henry was. <laughs> you know, it just, I know the least about Jane Seymour because there really hasn't been a whole lot out there about her. I haven't found like a whole biography just about Jane Seymour. Um, I think just because she was young and she died so young, nobody, we really aren't sure what she, what her potential was going to be. Um, but the other wives, you know, there's a lot of biographies about them mm -hmm. and it's actually pretty interesting to see their personalities. And I really wanted to bring that into this book because they, you know, they, they, you know, we are remembering them because you know, there are so many books about them, but I think it's interesting to see how would they be in today's world. Mm -hmm. Went off with your head wasn't really likely to happen. I mean, people still die. Right. 
unexpectedly, <laughs> but you know, to try to remember that Henry literally had the power of life and death over anybody. And, you know, that's a, a really frightening thing to live with. Yeah. And it was his whim. I mean, it was, well, like when Catherine Parr, you know, he, there was, there was an arrest warrant for her. And she managed to talk her way back into his good favor, like moments before they were going to serve her with this arrest warrant. So she could have found herself locked up in the tower, just, you know, like, like Catherine Howard or Anne Boleyn did. Yeah. Could have been a seventh wife. Who knew? <laughs> could have been. Yeah. I don't know. By then he was really old and sick. I don't know. <laughs> He wasn't that old. You know, that's the other thing to remember is that all of this happened in a fairly compressed time frame. Henry didn't live to be old. Yeah, no. Yeah, he was in his late 50s. Yeah, but, but he was but he had a lot of health issues and the jousting accident and he had his gout and he was right. obese. I mean, they had to carry him around in a like a yeah. big I think they had some sort of mechanized thing where they that's carried true. him around. Yeah, if you if you go back to you know him on the field of the cloth of gold, he was actually you know when very young, um, you know handsome and fit and you know all of that stuff, and then good living ruined him, which yes. same thing was true with George the Fourth, who was you know a handsome young prince and turned into the same kind of you know dreadful old character. So good living and and self indulgence was not a recipe for. Sounds like um, Elvis. Yeah, right. They're telling <laughs> us that all the time. The Wall Street Journal had a whole thing, I think it was yesterday, about, you know, if you want to live well, if you want to age well, maybe it was today, because there are now spas that people can go to and pay extraordinary sums to sort of fend off aging. But, you know, the basic rules, you know, don't smoke, don't drink a lot, watch your diet, get exercise, stay socialized, you know, um, are recipes that, that could have worked for those guys, but, but didn't. So there we are. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been fun to talk to you. Um, all of you watch, sorry to have rambled around like this, but uh, it's really been a good time. Um, and I truly think that this is, you know, it's hard to find something that's really unusual and yet, and yet fits the crime genre. I mean, it's hard. It's everything new and the same all at the same time. And this is one of those books that's just really so much fun. So we still have signed copies and I hope you'll buy one. And Karen, I'll keep me posted on whether you're going to wrestle the sequel down to the ground, do you? I will keep you posted. And thank you so much. This was wonderful. I really, at some point, I'll come out to Scottsdale and we can meet in person. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be absolutely great. I would love that. So um, for those of you who have nothing else to do this afternoon, we have another historical mystery event with C.S. Harris and her, I think it's the 16th, maybe it's the 18th, but I think it's the 16th, Sebastian St. Cyr Regency mystery. So we'll be doing that in, in uh an hour and five minutes. <laughs> so join us for that if you can. And remember, you can also, you can watch these anytime. If you can't join us live, um, they're going to stay up there for a long time. And so you can always come back to them. And if you have a smart TV, you can take the YouTube video and watch it on your smart TV. So, Or you can watch an old school podcast. That's true. Or listen, can, listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast too. Yeah. So lots of ways to enjoy these author conversations. So Keep it in mind. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much. A pleasure.